que vayan, acompáñenos. Mi nombre es Luis Fernando Martínez, soy Country Manager de Razer en México y quiero presentarles a alguien muy especial. Ahí está, ahí atrás. Quiero presentarles el día de hoy, esta noche, a nuestro fundador que nos acompaña, porque sabemos que muchos de ustedes son emprendedores, que tienen un camino que están emprendiendo en el mundo de los negocios, en el mundo de la tecnología. Y queremos compartir con ustedes la experiencia de Robert Krakow cuando inició Razer hace no muchos años y todas las instancias por las que pasó en esta etapa de emprendimiento. Los invito a quedarse y a darle una fuerte bienvenida y un fuerte aplauso a Robert Krakow, por favor. So now, how are you? Buenas noches. That's about all you're going to get in Spanish from me. I apologize. I'm going to try to do this in English. Just a question: How many people? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, how many people here for the first time? How many of you are? Uh, I, like myself, this is my first time at a campus party. How many people here? This is all oh, good. Okay, great. So I'm not alone. This is quite, a, quite an operation. I, I love being here. This is great. Um, I'm going to talk. How many of you are actually uh, either entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs? Okay. I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about the, the, uh, the challenges and the pitfalls and the, uh, and, and the, and the highs and lows of uh, going into business for yourself and forming a company. Um, I, uh, let's see. About 20 years ago, we had a dream. Um, we dreamed that gaming would grow to become a multinational phenomenon all over the world, that there would be a, a huge wave of gaming and gaming growth. But we were one of the few and maybe the only people that believed it at the time. I mean, I'm talking 1990 early 1990s. And the other thing that we believed and we strongly believed is that gamers would want and need better equipment for themselves. Uh, at the time, we were doing a lot of, I was doing a lot of testing of uh, new games. I was doing alpha and beta testing for games that have become phenomenally popular games like Wolfenstein and Doom and I was, be, I was given the mouse that came with the system. Remember, in those days, every mouse came with the system. And nobody ever bought a new mouse. Nobody cared about the mouse. It was just like it came with the system, right? Just like your keyboard came with the system you bought. Well, unfortunately, those mouse were, became too slow. They were, they were, they were not accurate. Uh, and they were just underpowered to play. I mean, these games, were de they were developing new engines, powerful new engines, new pixels, uh, more pixels, more sprites, higher resolution. And it was all very, it was all growing, and it was all coming. And I said, Don't, can I get a better mouse? And the guy said, no, this is, all, this is the best mouse you can get. These mice were made for home office use. They're not made for gaming. But if you have the money and if you're smart enough, you'll create a gaming mouse. And I said, yeah, right, that's what I need create a gaming mouse. So anyway, I, I kind of, we kind of began our search, my partner and I. We had, we had a, a big idea. Big idea was to design this killer mouse and uh, the rest of the world would beat, a, door, you know, beat a, a path to our door that we would be rich and famous and powerful and sign autographs and kiss babies and whatnot. But we didn't know where to begin. We didn't know where to start. We were like really babes in the woods that didn't really understand what, was, what it took to have a company, to build a company. We didn't have any money. I mean, this is the, this is the biggest problem that entrepreneurs face. Have an idea, a pretty good idea, right? You're going you're gonna to 
build this great widget, this new technology, you're going to design the, you know, the pyramids or something, but you don't have any money. You're broke. We were broke gamers. <laughs> and we didn't have any money to start a company or let alone, you know, buy lunch. It was bad. We also didn't have any idea for a product. Engineering-wise, we weren't engineers. We didn't have a, a concept. We didn't have a design. We had no engineering skills. No money, no design, no engineering skills. Good start. So, <laughs> we, we realized we needed a, a, some kind of a metric so that people could understand that this mouse is not just a home office mouse, this mouse is going to be designed for gaming. So we thought about it and we said, you know, dots per inch is a great measurement and if we can increase the dots per inch, which at that time was about 450 dots per inch uh, that a mouse moved. So that meant that if you wanted to get across the screen of your 15-inch monitor, you had to go once, pick up the mouse, go twice, and then a half to get from one side of the int to the other. That's how bad resolution was. That's how low it was. And if you had an Apple mouse, it was worse. That was 250 DPI. And we said, we can, we can create a better technology. So that was our entry level. Find a metric that was really great, and then increase that metric so that the mouse could be faster, more accurate, more precise. So DPI was how we actually got into the business and got started. <clears throat> but we didn't have, other than that, we had no new technology. We were aware that, uh, uh, that, that there was a new light encoder that could revol revolutionize the industry. And, but we, we didn't own the rights to it. <laughs> we had no money to buy it. We didn't own the rights to it, but we knew that that's what we needed. Because so, the light encoder would help with resolution. It would give you that DPI advantage. So where to begin, right? Well, I flew to China on somebody else's money. And I met with the inventor uh, of this, this encoder. And I requested that he license this technology to us. Just license it. I didn't offer any money. <laughs> because I didn't have any money. And he listened. And this is kind of a good picture of him, because not really him, but that's kind of what he did. He didn't really trust me. He didn't believe in me. But I had this idea that we were going to create this mouse that all gamers would want, right? And he said, but you have no money. And I said, yes, but I have a great idea, great concept. You need to invest in this. So he said, okay, I'll go along with this for a year and see what happens. So now we had the rights. But we needed to raise money. Uh, this is where almost every company fails. You never have enough money. I wanted to raise 10 million. And we used a broker. We actually used a broker to go out and get the money. Now, we went, first obviously, we went to, we didn't have a government, no government aid, so this is in the US, we had to do this on our own. We got a, I went and hired a broker and he said, well, the venture capitalists, all the, all the big investors, they're never gonna talk to you, they're not gonna listen to you until you build this company for five years. I said, I'll never get to five years, how will I ever get there? So we hired this guy, and this, uh, this broker who had lots of contacts in the industry with investors, small investors, very small investors, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars at a t time. So you can imagine how long it takes to get to seven million dollars at ten thousand dollars per person. It was really, really, really hard, and I wanted to get to ten million. Never happened. So. Our, our business model said, at the worst case scenario, you need $7 million to, to build this product and do the marketing and do the business side and the, release, and the, and the launch. So the small investors, they're all really, really hard to, get, to deal with. I don't know if any of you have ever had to deal with what they call angel investors. 
but that's what these guys are. And like I said, the, the model was to raise small sums, 25 to 50 tops. Nobody was going to invest more. And you've got to remember, this is like 1999 when people wanted to just throwing money at technology. The dot-coms were like going crazy. Everything was going crazy. So people had money to burn. I mean, they really did. They were just throwing money at anything and everything that moved. We thought we had a pretty viable concept, but you know, after two years of, of meeting, and I met, I went to every investor meeting with this broker, every investor meeting all over the U.S. And after two years, we were lucky to raise 4.1 million. And we said, you know, we, we've got now we've got this idea. And someone else is going to come along and steal it if we don't market it, if we don't get to, to market soon, right? So we needed to close the investment loop with a $3 million shortfall. I'm telling you that that's not the way to do it, but that's what, what we did. It's so difficult raising money, and it's so rewarding, but when you don't raise enough, it causes all kinds of waves in the background that uh, so our biggest challenges. Investors thought that we were going to be a niche product. Gaming was just a niche. Gaming wasn't really here to stay. It was small. It, it was at the time. It was very small. There were no big developers out there. There were uh, no big publishers out there at the time. You know, Activision barely existed. They had 10 people in the company. Blizzard had 20 people in the company. It was just really, really small p time. And they didn't believe our vision that gaming was going to become universal worldwide in every niche, in every pocket, in every place. They also, they worried that there was a real small number of buyers out there, end users, that there wouldn't be enough, and, they, and that they wouldn't buy a mouse designed for gaming. After all, mice came with the system. Why would you buy a, a new mouse? We found out, and we had to go to the investors and say, by the way, only 1% of the world's population replaces their mouse every year, back in 1999, or it was actually before that. So we didn't have a really good story to tell, but we did raise 4.1 million. Uh, most, of, <laughs> most of these investors didn't understand when I talked gaming. What's gaming? What is computer gaming? What the hell is that? I have no idea what that is. And they, they finally would say, oh, wait a minute. That's online gambling, right? And I'd say, I'd be so worn down, I'd say, yeah, right, it's, it's online gambling. Uh, but they didn't really believe that there was going to be a pop culture for entertainment around, built around the computer. Their idea of a computer was, Oh, yeah, a computer for your home, a home computer, that's to bring work home. That's not for entertainment. That's for doing spreadsheets and Excel and all that fun stuff. Bringing my work home and so I don't have to stay in the office all night long. That's a home computer. You know, so it was tough. It probably wouldn't be so tough today, but, but by today it would be too late. Somebody else would have taken our idea, obviously, and run with it. So. They didn't get gaming. So, and as I said, they thought it was online gambling and no one ever replaced their mouse. It's pretty tough, pretty tough. Plus, as I mentioned, we started out underfunded, $3 million underfunded. So, after we invested in people, we, bought, we got some people, we did some market research, we bought, we went outside and we bought uh, engineering design. Uh, we did our, so our, our system software development there, our, our drivers and whatnot, outside. And we, lo we, we launched our first mouse, which was called the Razor Boomslang. Well, Boomslang is actually uh, a predatory snake uh, in South Africa. Actually, it's pronounced Boomslang in, I don't, if I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak South, South African either, but, uh, we were ready to, with a product. We had done our research, 
we had done a lot of uh, what's called contextual research. We actually went into people's home and their office and interviewed them, and we would study their artifacts. We would find out, oh, this guy's got a mini refrigerator next to his PC, and then he's got a microwave oven. And this is, you know, this, and, this, and, and, it, and this is how you study people and you understand what their needs are. So we did a lot of research. We did a lot of engineering. We did a lot of testing. But by then, we were almost out of money. But we launched the first product and under the Razor brand. We spent, I, I could actually do an hour on how we actually developed the branding materials and all the elements behind that, and it took, took us quite some time. And we had some real purpose behind that. And I never really mentioned this before, but even though we were broke, we were pretty smart guys. So, we did a pretty good job on branding. You know, the design and the elements are still there today that they were 20 years ago. Um, but we wanted to be edgy. We wanted to tell people that gaming was hardcore. And we wanted to appeal to the avid gamer. So we wanted to be aggressive. We wanted to be in their face. We believe most of them were men. At that time, it was mostly males, probably 95% of the gamers. It's not that way today, but that's the way it was then. The other thing they didn't like is they didn't trust marketers. They didn't trust what we had to say. They didn't believe a word we said. Whatever we would tell them was bullshit because we were the man. We were the big company, right? Well, we were a small company, but you know, if we ran a magazine ad uh, in PC Gamer that said how phenomenal the boom slang mouse is for gaming, would you have believed it? I wouldn't. I don't believe, I don't believe game marketers. You know, and I'm freaking old. So, you know, <laughs> these, this is a, so they just didn't trust big companies. We needed to stand apart from our design. Now, this is actually isn't our design, <laughs> but we wanted to be unique. We wanted to people, when people saw the mouse, they say, oh, that's that razor thing, thingy. But that's that gaming mouse. Uh, and we only had one product or, you know, we had a 1,000 DPI and a 2,000 DPI mouse. Remember what I said before was that all mice were, before were 450, unless it was an Apple mouse, which was 250 DPI. So we were able to, to jump the DPI up to, four, to 2,000, up to 2,000, which was a pretty phenomenal piece of uh, technology using that, that, that Chinese Chino man, we used his invention his little light encoder to build this crazy mouse. Um, so we, fe we felt like our, our product needed to have kind of a, like a space age look to it. So these are some of the early concept drawings that we had. And actually, uh, which one was it? Uh, the one in the lower left-hand corner uh, is the one that we actually selected and went with. Uh, it looked kind of like a bat, Batmobile, you know, but we, we thought it was cool. And a lot of the gamers thought it was cool. It was very different, and we had to break through. With only one product, that was all you had to work with. We were very aggressive also with our graphic design, our logos, uh, all, uh, our, also our industrial design for our products were very aggressive, and um, it helped with our image. And again, like I say, this, this stuff is, this, this stupid three-headed snake is 20 years old now. You want, might want to sing happy birthday to him, but don't. Uh, it's, um, and it's lasted. It's lasted. It's, it is the mark. It's the brand. We have, I can't tell you how many gamers have actually had permanent tattoos of this design all on their bodies. I don't have one. Actually, <laughs> there was an agreement that when our company hit between myself and the co-founder, when, uh, when Razor hit 100 million in sales, we were both going to get tattoos. Razor just, uh, just, I can't really tell you this, but Razor just hit one and a half billion dollars in sales. We're privately held, so we don't disclose that, so don't tell anybody. And I still don't have a tattoo. <laughs> I'm, I'm a wuss. I don't want that needle on me. For those of you guys who have tattoos, power to you. I love you. I just, I, I, look, I've gone this long without one. Anyway, a lot of our, our inspiration came from things that we studied in architecture. 
we were architecturally interested in design. We felt design was like really important. So we did a lot of unique things with, with materials, lit graphics, non-tangent cur curves. Most people were just doing like, you know, uh, standard curves. We did some things unique. Um, a lot of uh, accent colors, uh, things that other people hadn't done before. We were the first company to do light, light strips, things like that. First of all, gamers told us we don't care about that, but boy, they sure buy it. So we were really, in, in our design detail, it made a point. And, and the reason I mention this to entrepreneurs is that you have to look at the details. You have to look at every single detail. You have to be your own hardest critic. You cannot just, you know, accept things because it looks nice. It's got to look incredible. It's got to feel incredible. And I'm not talking about human factors or ergonomics. I'm talking about how the, how the product looks to you when you see it every day, when you walk to your desk and you look down at your keyboard and your mouse and your mouse pad and your headsets and your speakers, and you say, I'm proud of that. That's, that's who I am. That tells me who I am. That talks to me. So this stuff's important. Design is important. The, 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 the devil is in the details. You've heard, probably heard that before. It really, really is. We did like design matrices. This is a little hard to read, but essentially we, we, we said on one side we wanted to do something clean and high quality and very minimalistic, and on the other side we wanted it to be extreme as well. So that was kind of finding, you know, the happy medium between being crazy and being utilitarian but still high quality. We wanted, we wanted the out-of-box experience to be memorable and to be exciting. You know, when you, the, we found that the actual, the out-of-box experience to be just as important as the moment you buy the product. The box, is, box talks to you. So that's, again, it's that attention to detail, entrepreneurs, attention to detail. Packaging is just as important as the, as the concept, the design. All that stuff that I told you about, you know, uh, industrial design elements that we studied, it's no more important or less important is the packaging, the out-of-box experience. And at retail, it turns out to be just as important as the product reputation. You know, you can have a pretty good reputation, but if you got really shit uh, packaging, forget it. Packaging's important. The whole experience, everything that you have, from your, your, all of your materials, you know, uh, is just, you know, probably the most important thing. Here's some more of the packaging. You know, we've done some, we, we've won, like, awards that you might, you, you get sick, so you, know, you see so many awards for packaging and design. But that's, uh, we, don't, we don't design it for the rewards, but it helps to have them. Uh, this was the packaging of the original Boom slang. It was in a cookie tin, so you actually take the label off of it and remove that label, and you had this nice shiny cookie tin to keep your mouse in. And, it, and we did that on purpose because we knew that gamers wanted portability. They wanted to be able to take their mouse to a LAN party, to a BYOC, to a tournament, to an event, to a campus party, anywhere. They wanted to be able to take it. Uh, we also where, I don't know if you can see the sponsored gamers there, but we actually sponsored about a dozen 1v1 gamers back in 19, this is 1999. And we were the first company to sponsor gamers. Now, remember, we had no money, so the sponsorships were basically product and maybe pay for your travel. Maybe, if you won. <laughs> and the biggest name of all was Fatality. We were the first sponsor for Fatality. Guy's gone on, made a lot of money for himself doing other things, but we got him started. Um, and there were, besides the four on here, there were another eight to 10 gamers that we sponsored. So again, getting involved with the industry, attention to detail. So anyway, with all this preparation, what happened? Well, remember we were underfunded for launch day Initially, we sold over the first two years about 400,000 units, which was good. But 
after three years, we weren't selling a whole lot. We needed a new product. We didn't have money to do the design and engineering to, uh, for the next product, which we wanted to do it was a keyboard. So we had built about a 40-person staff, of which I was one, and I'm the only one left out of that original 40 people. And it makes me sick because these people worked hard and we just ran out of money and we had to let them all go. And then from 2000 to 2003, I kept the brand alive and didn't draw a salary for three years because I believed in the, pro the brand, I believed in the product, I believed that something would happen. Um, and we had, a, we had some really minor you know, uh, agreements with some European uh, distributors and our product was still being sold, but it wasn't enough to do anything. And we, could, we, had, we let all these wonderful people go because we were underfunded from day one. My, my best lesson to any, anybody is always raise more than you think. Um, I, we had a rebirth, thank God. <laughs> um, I, we all survived, well, I survived. <laughs> Until 2005, I was the only one left. Um, we, had, we, we found a partner in Singapore uh, he was a great uh, uh, godsend to us. He breathed new, new money and new life into the company. We developed our, the, the first gaming optical mouse at the time. So our first mouse, the Boomslang, was uh, actually a ball mouse. And uh, so we also then, in 2005, came out with the uh, our next mouse. We started opening offices. I, I went to San Diego, opened the home office which is just last year moved to Irvine, California. Uh, we had an office in Singapore. And uh, today we have, I think, 14 offices around the world. Um, we had five or six employees in 2005. In 2016, we have 1,000 employees. Uh, we coined our motto as for gamers by gamers. And the way we did that was we realized that we were only hiring gamers. If two people came to us who had the same credibility job, you know, the same experience, same level of experience, same level of education, all we did was said, well, you're a gamer and you're not, so we hire the gamer. And that was what we believed in. So we became for gamers by gamers, and that was our belief. And it is today, still today. I would say of those 1,000 people that we have in the company now, 99% of them are gamers. There's only a few, and they're in non-gaming, you know, like financial services or something. Uh, not that that isn't important, but we, it, we would prefer to have a gamer if we can. Um, so anyway, this, this is our official birth. If you go to our site and you see the history of Razor, it doesn't go back to, to 1995, it starts at 2005. Because we really, this is when we b were born. I like to tell, the only reason I tell the backstory is because so many of you are entrepreneurs, and as entrepreneurs you really need to know where those pitfalls are uh, and how you deal with them. Um, so, you know, our, part of our rebirth was that we, expand, we, we expanded in the new game hard, hardware categories. We started with mouse pads, speakers, headsets, and keyboards. Uh, we opened new offices. Uh, I mentioned the one in, uh, we opened one in San Francisco. Uh, Sing Singapore, we enlarged, we've enlarged that office. There's now, I think, about 300 people in the Singapore office. Um, we went into Germany, where uh, we have an office in Hamburg. We have three offices in China, one in Korea, uh, one in India, and in Latin America is the most recent. Uh, and we're, by the way, we are extremely excited to be in Latin America. I actually live about an hour away from here, so I love this place, you know. But it's one of the, pl the, the things that I really believe is part of the great growth of this industry is how it, we're riding the crest of this wave. And the wave hasn't even peaked yet. Gaming is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. 
So anyway, this is kind of our map right now. About four or five years ago, we passed Logitech as the market leader, market share leader in both mice and keyboards. Between Logitech and Razer, we own 90% of the mouse business and 91% of the keyboard business, with Razer having uh, quite a bit more than Logitech. And I, I'm not bragging, but this is what can happen you know, when you turn the corner and you've built your company right. Even though you have financial problems, even though you have you know, all these, you lose people that you didn't want to lose, uh, you, might, you might work for nothing for a period of time. Stay with it. Don't give up. Never, ever give up. <clears throat> we, we entered the portable systems um, category with the blade about four years ago. Now, that isn't really available at this point in Mexico, but that product one day will be. And it's really a cool product. We, we, re we recognize that nobody was doing anything in, in, in terms of innovation. They were all, all of our competitors, all the people that were making notebooks, were trying to go to the lowest price. Low, I can go lower than you. Oh, I can go lower than you. There was no innovation. When you start going for the lowest price and the lowest solution, there's no more innovation. You basically eliminate all innovation. So with our partner, Intel's help, we built the blade, and it's really doing well. Um, we also kind of, we didn't like decide to leave gaming, but we had a, we, we had a really unique s situation that came up within the company. Now, uh, I went to business school like 100 years ago, and they used to, even 100 years ago, they said, my teacher said, well, do you want to make it or do you want to buy it? What do you mean? Make versus buy. You got to decide whether you want to make it yourself. You own your own company. You have a product. You're going to make it or you're going to buy it. Okay. So this industry, this hardware industry, all of it, every bit of it, from, you know, from, uh, from, from us down to everybody in the industry buys it. They buy it. I can go to China uh, and a big show, China Joy show, big show, t 10 times, I mean 20 buildings, and I can walk down and one line and one room, one big room, bigger than this room, and it's all mice, all mice. And I can say, hmm, I want that mouse with that cord, with that technology, with this software, and I will buy it. And if I was in business school, my professor would say, you get an A. You get an A because you just decided to, you just did what the right thing is. You bought it. You're going to get a better return on your investment. You're not going to have to have all these people. Well, I didn't, I failed that class, as I think. Uh, as I remember, I got thrown out of the class several times because I wanted to make it. My ego said, I can make it better than I can buy it. So today, of our thousand people, probably three quarters of them are either engineers, mechanical electrical engineers or software engineers, or industrial designers. We design, develop, and conceptualize every Razor product. Nobody. Nobody in our industry, including Logitech, does that. Okay? It's crazy. But we do it. So what we decided was, because we have this homemade technology, this, 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 this built-in group of crazy designers and people who had unbelievable futuristic ideas and had some wonderful ideas that we said, you know what? We need to go beyond just gaming and go into like interactive entertainment products. So that's when we decided to do that. That was about three or four years ago. <clears throat> so we also had to really deci decide who the gamer was. This was. Now this goes kind of back to the early days when we were really deciding who we wanted to market to and what their taste levels were. Guys are prou proud to be gamers, they're very proud, women and men. 
they believe they're winners. They want to shout the fact that they, they, they've won. They want to be able to beat the crap out of their opponents and then have bragging rights. Like, you know, I, uh, you know. And they want quality gear that lasts. And they want, they're willing to pay a little bit more for a product if it can deliver what it, you promise it delivers, whether it, it's problem free, it works first, works out of the box, and, if you, and that you stand behind your product. Those are what's called trade-up products. So we made that decision. Um, we also, in catering to our market, we wanted to know where they got the information. If they don't trust marketers, who do they trust? So we looked at, you know, people that were experts in the, in, in the press, who were doing product reviews. We looked at people who were doing online reviews. Uh, and then we were looking at what we call the expert gamer or the taste maker, the taste maker. This is the guy that we've all gone to when we wanted to become a gamer and we wanted to ask him, what's the best system to use? What's the best operating system for gaming? What's the best mouse to use? What's the best keyboard to use? What games will I enjoy? What genre will I like? Blah, 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 blah. Those are taste makers and we needed to cater to them. Now, what game makes gamers so different? Well, <laughs> I mean, these guys are wired from, uh, from the day one. When you guys, I think you guys are born wired. I mean, <laughs> you guys, you dominate social networks, you dominate, you blog every day, you chat, you ICQ, you, you, you fill forums with topics and discussions and forums react to, uh, and you interact with companies. You know, one of the things, that, and I'm no big deal, you know, I'm lucky to be here, lucky to still be alive, no big deal. But what the smartest thing I ever did was I put my email address on the homepage of Razor Zone day one in 1995 for people to send questions and to communicate with us. Smartest thing I ever did. Get involved, understand what your customers need, understand who they are. I would go to events uh, all over the world and I would sit down with, with gamers and people, teams that we sponsored, players that we sponsored. I would eat, sit down two, three hours when they weren't gaming with them and, and try to pick their mind. What are your unmet needs? What is it about Razer products you like? What is it you don't like? So, that's where you get your information. You don't live in, we, we don't live in an ivory tower. We don't sit down and say, yeah, guys, this is what you're going to be using next year because we're Razer. That's not the way we work. And we don't believe in that. So anyway, this, uh, this is how you know who your customer is. <clears throat> well, I mentioned before, they, they, what their major want is, is they want to claim victory uh, in person or online. You know, and they want to shout it and they want to let everybody know that they won. And they want gear that's going to improve their game, enhance the gaming experience. They also want quality gear. They want stuff that's going to fall apart. They want something that reflects their passion for gaming and that they're proud of. I mentioned that when you go to your office and you sit down and you look at your product, you say, I'm proud of that. It makes me feel, it talks to me. That's who I am. Um, again, this is just definition of the tastemaker from the, di from the dictionary. I didn't write it, but this is what they say. It's a person who decides or influences what or will become fashionable. Okay? Important person. Where are they in the chart of gamer hierarchy? Well, you know, casual gamers over there in blue, they represent uh, a small, you know, small portion of them, but, uh, and we don't, and those are the people who want the information. They're the ones who the tastemakers are talking to. They're the ones who's just getting into gaming. You know, they've been playing, you know, Candy Crush or something, you know, and now they're, and now they're, they want to move, move up to, you know, to Unreal Tournament or something. So, uh, and then you got a real thin slice, so you can't even see it, which is a pro gamers. Pro gamers, 
They're crazy. Nobody, they don't talk to anybody. Nobody talks to them. They don't help anybody. They're in this thing for one thing, to make money, to get famous, to get a, con you know, get, get a sponsor. So it's that 29% which are avid gamers. Those are the tastemakers, and that's who we market, market Razor products to, hard, hardware to. We have from the very beginning. We don't market to the casual gamers. They'll find out about it from, you know, hand-me-down information. Now, I'm going to talk, try, I don't know how I'm doing on time, so I'm going to talk quick about ex execution because <clears throat> implementation is so important. And, I, and I, I, hope, I hope I'm not really repeating myself to make it boring. It's bad enough I'm speaking in English. So, uh, but there are really three parts of the creative process. The first part is inspiration. You have to have a great idea. I'm inspired. I got a great idea. How do I do? What do I do with it? Well, then you have to form a strategy. That's the second part of inspiration. Form a strategy, you know, and stick to it. The last one is implementation, and this is where I really think you have to. Everybody has to really have soul searching. Am I going to implement this product? in the best light, the best possible way. I've got a pretty good idea. I've got a pretty decent strategy. I've written a business plan or a communications plan. Now, what's my vision? A vision without ex execution is a hallucination. So, the, pr the, the company or the product or the entrepreneur who best executes his strategy or her strategy is the winner. It's always the winner. If you, you're going to have similar products, you're going to have competition, it's like Razor does, we have a lot of competition. Why do we have the world's largest market share? Mice, keyboards, we're number two in, heads, in, in audio. Why, you know, we're number one in mouse pads. Why, why do we, how do we get there? It's because our strategies are sound, and our execution is flawless. And that's how you take the majority of sales. <clears throat> so, industry leader has got to have the ability to set a clear vision, translate that into consistent strategy, and deliver results year after year. <clears throat> now, I have to tell you that uh, unique design, flawless manufacturing, Clever marketing isn't enough. I don't know what this product is, but it didn't do well. It probably had all those things going for it. It had a very unique design, probably had, looks like it was manufactured pretty nice, but it's not around anymore. You gotta have, you have to have the ability to execute. And you have to have, in order to get market share, the top market share, you have to be able to seize and capture the imagination and get the res earn the respect, not get, but earn the respect of your customers, and that ties to loyalty. So people who buy Razor products are usually very, very loyal, and that's because we've executed pretty much flawlessly. Uh, customer centricity. Um, the idea of, of, of creating a, a unique brand is how well you connect with the people you serve. How do you connect with them? I don't mean how well I'm connecting with you, but how does your product connect with them? Um, it's, how, it's how you express customer centricity in everything from marketing to packaging to design to engineering to all the human factors, the ergonomics of the products to where it's made, logistics, the operation side of it, market research, and on and on and on. Those are all, those are all hard facts, hard work, and certainly not faddish. Um, actually, this should have said part two. I can't count. But this is the inspiration. And if you can dream it, you can do it. I started gaming in 1983, yes? I was only three years old, but I, I started gaming uh, in 1983, and I saw the original gaming industry crash 
uh, that year. Actually, I started in the late 70s, before I was born. And, um, <laughs> and I, uh, th this was a billion dollar industry, billions of dollars, that one day was gone. But what it did, what it left, and it, it almost destroyed the, the booming industry that led to the bankruptcy of many of these products, Atari, um, Commodore, a lot of these companies went under. And then publishing companies that were springing up at the time, they went under. Uh, now here's the good news. What happened from that is the early console market led, a, led the way to home computers as entertainment devices and not to bring work home. You know, that's, I spent six years working for IBM. IBM always believed that the only reason people wanted a home computer was to bring it home, bring work home. I couldn't believe it. So, anyway, what it led to was the eventual, was, was to gaming, computer gaming, and the eventual need for, for gamers to own better hardware. Hardware that actually helped their, helped their game, right? So, overnight it changed from becoming uh, you know, bring work home to hobbyists, news and information seekers, social networking participants, and many other forms of entertainment that were actually, you could make money on like video production services. People can actually make money with their computer besides playing games. So early console gaming from the 70s and 80s disrupted the way we used our home computers in a good way and which is one of the reasons why our timing was perfect, Razor's timing to get into it. There was a new wave of gaming interest that was growing, it was building. <clears throat> and it changed everything. Early game, gaming was responsible, as I mentioned before, for triggering this entertainment revolution. And so how did we join that revolution? You know, well, we fed the inspiration. People wanted our products, or products like ours. There was a need. Uh, ultimately, every new Razer product is fed by the gamer, and it seeks out the, the gamer's unmet needs. Now, gamers don't know what those unmet needs are, so it's really up to you as an entrepreneur to find out your customer's unmet needs. And the only way to do that is by talking to them, spending time with them, listening to them, having an open door, or open, open email source, flow of information going back and forth. And eventually, and I'm not that smart, but eventually someone's going to say something and do something or write something to me that triggers something, and I'm going to say, yeah, that's what we want to be. We want to fulfill those unmet needs. So. In order to feed that inspiration, every Razor product has to meet a very ultra-rigorous ultra internal demands, and by doing such, become phenomenal. At least we hope so. Uh, so, execution. Some people aren't, aren't used to an environment, living, working in an environment where excellence is expected. But if any of you ever, and I hope you, some of you will come wind up working, for us, or partners with us, and you will find out that we demand excellence. A fun place to work, gaming's everywhere, but we demand excellence, everything we do. To understand that gamer, we want to make them proud of their passions, and we don't want to short sell their, their images, their visions, their dreams. We want to reinforce the power of gaming as a unique pop culture. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like gaming. It is, it is the most phenomenal piece of pop culture that we've had since, I don't know, what was the last one? Books? <laughs> you know, TV? Come on. You're not going to have, you're not, not going to fulfill your life by watching reality TV. In fact, you're going to lose brain cells. Gaming helps us. It's good for the brain. It's really good for the brain. It really, really helps encourage the, the new growth of neurons, of the connectors, the synapses of the brain. 
I could do a whole hour on that, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, but it's an important part of Razor, the execution that we have developed our product categories, which augment our, our customers' life themes. One of the things we, we probably already knew, but we recognized one day, is that gamers did other things than play games. They love music, they love clothing, they, you know, loved entertainment of all kinds, they loved movies, they had, uh, a, they had a, a, a love affair with food. There was a lot of themes, life themes, that our gamers that were buying Razer part, products could, uh, could be benefit. And again, remember, we had this built-in technology base of designers and developers and, and engineers and hardware and software engineers that are just ready and waiting to do something fun and different. So we got into apparel and entertainment products under the Razer brand. <clears throat> we also decided that it's important to win some awards, at least industry awards. Um, five years ago, I was at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and for the fifth year, Razer was nominated for Best of CES. It's quite a, quite a uh, thing. There's 10,000 competitors in other categories, TVs and cars and whatnot, that is competing against us. We're this little tiny company, particularly five years ago, small company, and for five years, we were nominated, and for five years, I would walk this long walk to get to the final, you know, the awards area, and every year we'd lose. And then I'd have the long walk back, feeling like, well, we tried, we got there, we didn't make it. Um, the last five years, we've won best of show every year for five years. Best of CES, the only company in the 60-year history of CES to win best of show five years in a row. Little tiny whippersnapper company competing against Intel and Microsoft and Philips and whoever, Logitech, and anybody else. And there's a lot of people that enter. And Razor has won it. And we don't have anything to do with the judging, believe me. Five years. Makes that walk shorter, by the way. So we win awards, we sponsor games, gamers, it's really important, and we live the life. We live the life of gaming. And those are important parts of our competitive DNA. Um, so to us, execution equals excellence. And excellence is, my definition of that is to do common things in an un, in common, in an uncommon way. And you know, over the years, you know, it takes us sometimes two to three years to get a product complete into the market. So we don't have that many opportunities to do excellence. To, um, and so every one of them needs to be really excellent because this is our life. So today, we're international, hundreds of employees, thousands of employees now in offices all around the world, and we're known as for the relentless pursuit of perfection. And all of that, you know, essentially comes down to those, those things. So anyway, we have um, we've expanded our reach of pure gaming and hardware, related to entertainment and devices. So, and so part of our, 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 our new products include interactive entertainment, portable game systems, VR, uh, wearable technology, which is interesting. Um, and will grow. And our culture internally is that every associate uh, work contributes to the greater good of the end user and our brand, and we really encourage in, in, internal innovation. So our culture is where good ideas and hard work are shared. Uh, we strive to be a really good co uh, corporate citizen, and we foster innovation and creativity. It's uh, part of the ongoing commitment to improve the customer journey and ensure our product strategy is well-defined. And that's part of, again, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, all of that is so important to you. I hope you're kind of making mental notes or maybe even physical notes on some of these things because 
if you want to be successful, and you can be successful in this business, there are still plenty of room and opportunity for new products. Our management has great hope for the future, and we instill power of the, uh, the present. This is my partner, uh, uh, Min Lang Tan. And um, we strive to be a thought leader in our business model and our marketing sector. We hire according to our cultural fit first, which is gamers and foremost. And then we have a culture that is owned and propelled by the gamers who put their value and their voices directly into our products. So that's my sad story. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> we, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that I was, had the opportunity to uh, come here. Oh, okay, um, and uh, it's a great opportunity, and I have, I have the microphone here, so who wants to be the first? Do you want to be the first, sir? All right. <laughs> Is it working? Not, no funciono. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Robert. Hi. Um, okay, I want to work with you. What can I do? What can you do to work for us? Well, we have a, a careers, and because we have so many employees, and because we have a fairly good turnover, there are jobs every week by office, and they're listed at careers on razorzone.com. The best thing to do is to go there and check every week, because there's new postings every week by office. Decide which office is right for you, decide what job position is over you, and apply. And we get a lot of people coming through through that portal. We, we probably hire a good 30% of our employees through our career uh, posting. We, we don't go out to executive search for our firms and that sort of thing. We tend to hire around with a, a, a radius around our offices. So, you know, if you're interested in a job in San Francisco or Irvine, you need to relocate but, or, or be willing to relocate. But that's pretty much. Okay, thank okay. you. Who's next? Okay. Uh, over here, right? This man over here. Okay. Hi, Robert. Hi. Uh, well, uh, now virtual reality is uh, something that is uh, very, very, very seen. And how do you see in, in the game industry this kind of technology? Uh, well, we see that technology years ago, but right now is more accessible and more knowledge. How do you see this, this technology for, for the future? Yeah, I, I actually, um, I, uh, it's, uh, it's a great question. I, um, I kind of look at uh, virtual reality as backwards because it's a piece of hardware that needs in search of a killer app. We have actually been the other way for years. So we create hardware based on killer games. So a killer game comes out and it demands a, a game genre, a multi-button or a MMO or a, 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 whatever the genre is, we then design a product to fit it. Virtual reality is kind of backwards for gaming. It, it, and it's not gonna be successful till there's one killer app and for gaming. Now, where I see virtual VR, as being really exciting is in music, music videos, sports, other areas where it can, it can happen today. Gaming is gonna be a little while. Now, that said, Razer has a really unique open source virtual reality program. We have opened our source code to all game developers. This is something we said, we don't want to, you to pay us for, your, for anything. We don't, we're not after developers to do anything more than develop games specifically for VR. That's all we want. So we, uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, we opened our source code. We have about 600 uh, developers, small to medium-sized developers, developing games specifically for VR. So far we have 300 who have actually worked and developed a game. Somewhere in there uh, is going to be a killer app, somewhere eventually, at least we hope so. 
And all we've done is really foster the industry, not to help grow the industry. We don't really believe that we can be or should be like Oculus has done, is to say, you want, you want to develop a game, you have to buy our, our, our development kit, and when the game's developed, you have to pay us a royalty. The other thing we're not encouraging people to do is just to pour it over games that already exist. That's not going to you know, satisfy people when it comes to VR. You want new games, new experiences. You want games software developed specifically for the, for the, for the technology. So that's my opinion, just my opinion. <laughs> I don't know if everybody else shares that, but that's my opinion. Who's next? Is, uh, could you pass that back? Uh, according to you, which would be the qualities required uh, for a young entrepreneur uh, to face and meet all the challenges in order to, to fulfill his dreams uh, for a startup? I, I don't think it's a, it really any different today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. I think the principles are all the same. I think that you have to, <clears throat> you have an innovative thought, but you have to really spend more time on, on strategy and then all the rest of your time and money on execution. I think it's no different now, it, it will never change. It's always going to be the same thing. If you can't execute better than your competitor or somebody else, you will fail. If you can't raise enough money to see yourself through the first three or four years, chances are you'll fail. Probably 95% of the failures of, uh, in entrepreneurial businesses is lack of funds. So I encourage you to raise more money than you think you need, to write an incredibly good business plan or strategy to go along with your innovation, and then to have a uniqueness, a unique selling opportunity, if you wish, for your product or for your, or your service or your company or whatever your brand is. How can you be unique? How can you stand apart from everybody else? And how, am I, if I'm your customer, how is my life going to be improved by using your product or service? Am I going to look younger? Probably not. Am I going to feel better? Maybe, hopefully. Am I going to enjoy my game better if it's a game? Possibly. Am I going to get laid? Nah, maybe. <laughs> but I mean, those are all the things you have to think about. You know, um, it's, it's what's in it for the customer? And what, how can it be unique? And how can I uh, stand apart? And then how can I execute better than anybody else? And like I said, some of the, 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 the simplest things, some of the things that are, you never ever think about are some of the things you have to work the hardest on. Uh, who's, who's next? Can we get the, ah, okay. Um, I really wanted to ask you why it was always so hard, for example, Mexico being so close to America, why did it take so long for Razer product to come here? Why is it still now in 2016 so hard to yeah, get I, Razer product? The only place we can get, they're so much more overpriced than in America. Well, there's two things. One, uh, one, is, one is really uh, bad, three things. And that one of them is really bad is a lot of people in America believe that Mexico is a third world country. That's really bad. It isn't true but it's the way they believe. Perceptions, perception is often reality. That, that's number one. Number two is that Mexico was perceived for a long, long time as a console market, and Razer was primarily a PC company. So we didn't really, it didn't make a lot of sense to spend a lot of time and energy on the market, but the market has changed now, so it's become kind of equal, which is good, because that's really where the fun is. I mean. I, I mean, I like console gaming, but playing with a mouse and keyboard is so much better. So anyway, that's my opinion. So anyway, and the third is that our products are made in China, okay, because that's the only place you can make them, sorry. 
sorry, Mr. Trump, but that's it. Then we're big. And you, so, and then they go to, to um, they go to a staging area in Hong Kong, where they're then shipped by boat usually to Long Beach, California. And when they're then shipped by rail to Miami to a broker, and then come to Latin America. Every time you take a stop like that, it, it raises the price, slows things down, obviously. And lastly, you have fairly heavy value-added taxes and duty to deal with. So there are better ways of doing it. We're working on them. We're not perfect yet. Um, you know, there's the potential of manufacturing with flex here in Guadalajara. There's some potential there. There's things we're looking at. There are free trade zones in uh, um, Chile, two of them. No, no duty between Korea and Chile. So there's things that can be done. Now, it's going to take time to get that done, but we're working on it. We're aware of it. We know how big this market is even though some of us don't recognize that this is a first world country. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but there are a lot of people in the U.S. who refer to Mexico as a third world country. It makes me mad because I live here and I know it isn't. But it's, I'm, how do you change that? I, I tell them to visit. <laughs> so what, I don't know what else to tell them. I tell them they're full of shit and then go and visit the country. But, doesn't always work. So who else? Is, uh, where's our, our... No more? We're out of time. Oh, uh, But I'll hang around if anybody wants to come up and ask me. But... Doing what? Oh, yeah. We, we bought a small gaming company about a year ago called Oya, and we just announced our first, first Razer game. So Razer kind of easing into that category a little bit. Uh, I, I still think we're more of a hardware company, but it's, a, it's kind of fun to do it. We, we're being innovative. We're looking at new things, always looking at new things, always looking at the future. Uh, they're going to throw me off the stage. Well, I, thank you so much. I hope I, I haven't bored anybody. Um, it's really a pleasure, really a pleasure. And thank you for supporting Razor. I really thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh, you should probably leave this.